Welcome to the Alex webinar, Technical Services Librarians Matter at Your Library, Finding a Career in Technical Services. This webinar is sponsored by the Alex New Members Interest Group. I'm Erin Boyd, a member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee and co-vice chair of the Alex New Members Interest Group. We have three presenters today during the session. Our first presenter is Joshua Barton, head of copy cataloging and philosophy librarian at Michigan State University Libraries. Our second presenter is Sarah Simpson, Technical Services Manager of the Tulsa City County Library in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And our final presenter is Roberta Paulette, Director of Preservation at the Yale University Library. If you have any questions for any of our presenters during their presentations, please type your questions in the chat box on your screen. All questions will be answered at the conclusion of all the presentations, but you can type them at any time. If we run out of time, your questions will be answered offline and all participants will receive the questions via email. Today's session will be recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording and slides within a few days. Please note that you can communicate with other attendees through Twitter by using the hashtag AlexCE found at the bottom of the screen. We won't be monitoring the Twitter feed during this session. Before the presentations begin, we would like to start with a quick poll. The first question is, what is your status? Please choose the option that best describes you. Okay. Thank you. Our last question is, are you currently working in technical services? Please choose the option that best describes you. Thank you so much for your feedback. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to our presenters. All right. Uh, well, here we are. This is Joshua Barton. Um, that's me down there in the corner in my title. Um, I kind of geared my talk mostly towards people that were just coming to technical services to start. I saw from the poll that there are maybe about half that are involved in it already. Um, so, you know, you could take this for what it's worth. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. This is going to be what I do and um, some of the things that I found uh, were important to getting to where I am right now. So what I do, um, right now I manage a copy cataloging team at the MSU libraries. I've come into supervision in the last year and a half. And I consider copy cataloging as kind of the front lines of cataloging. Now libraries all over the world are creating descriptions for materials they acquire and then sharing those descriptions with other libraries. Our team looks for those pre-existing records, matches them up with things um, that come into the library, and maybe does a little bit of enhancement, fixes things, adds things, and then puts the records in our catalog. And taking advantage of this kind of shared cataloging saves a lot of time compared to having to describe everything from scratch. So I manage this team. I develop policies for what kinds of records we'll accept, and I coordinate my team's work with other teams in technical services. Now, I also do original cataloging on my own uh, monographs and serials. I, when I first came to MSU, I started as a serials cataloger. My job was going to be creating original records or cataloging from scratch for serial publications. 
but I had to learn regular monograph or book cataloging in order to get to serials cataloging. This entailed a lot, a lot, a lot of training, which I'll talk about a little later. Though um, I moved into supervision, like I said, like I said, I still do some cataloging on my own, though not as much as I used to. Um, one of the big things that I do is answer lots and lots of questions. Um, because I have this original cataloging background while managing a copy cataloging team, I end up answering a lot of questions from them. People will come to me with questions when records are confusing, when something looks incorrect in some kind of unusual way, or they need some kind of intervention that an original cataloger would provide. Some days are devoted almost entirely to fielding those kinds of questions and helping team members find solutions. I also end up answering cataloging questions from all over the library, not just from my team. And then I also do some collections work. Um, I, like they said, I, I uh, am the philosophy librarian, but that's a quarter time assignment. Um, I'm not going to really talk about that here, but if people have questions later, that's cool. Um, all of this is the stuff that's on my job description, but it's not all that I do. It's been my experience that cataloging work can kind of take you off in unpredictable directions if you let it. And you can also kind of guide your career in directions that are interesting to you. And that might be just because of where I work, but I think it's true at other libraries too. So what I do because of things that I did. Um, one example of this for me is my work with zines. Um, now, this isn't something that's in my job description, but it's become something that I'm known for doing around here. Zines, if you're not familiar with them, are self-published, usually short-run publications with some kind of underground or alternative bent to them. They're associated with um, punk rock in the 1970s and lots of related subcultures in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and they're still around today. Um, when getting started on serials cataloging, when I first came here in 2007, there were a lot of uncatalogued serials that had accumulated in our special collections. I had my choice of what I wanted to work on down there, and I kind of gravitated towards these out of personal interest. And they, they turned out to be a pretty significant, fairly unique collection. Um, so working on these led to presentations at conferences, connections with new donors who started sending us stuff. Uh, the chance to go to zine fests and exhibitions and buy materials for the library. And I even get referrals for zine-related reference questions. And these are all pretty non-traditional roles for a cataloger to be filling. Um, so, you know, kind of going with the flow, some of this stuff with the zines happened on its own. Some of it I made happen, you know, guiding the flow, just because I was interested in the subject. But it goes to show how in the right place you can uncover some pleasant surprises in technical services and you can make your own career what you want it to be to a certain extent. So um, just to back up and tell you how I got here, um, how I got started in cataloging and technical services that is, well it wasn't what I expected to be doing when I started library school. Cataloging wasn't on my radar at all. I was interested in reference, I was interested in public libraries, um, so being a cataloger at an academic library is pretty much the opposite of that. Um, so here's how that happened. Um, I went to a master's program that gave pretty small emphasis to cataloging. I think the most I did was maybe some mock-ups of MARC records on paper. And where I really got exposed to cataloging was in my student jobs and internships. One was for a small departmental library that was moving its catalog from this in-house citation management database to a small library automation system, which would give them their first online catalog. So that was a pretty big deal for them. I helped compare prospective systems before they bought one, so it was kind of a crash course in MARC records, copy cataloging, all that stuff. I didn't learn enough to, to be a cataloger myself there, but it helped me get familiar with the issues a cataloger faces, and that um, was a pretty big deal. That turned out to be really useful. At that job and others like it, um, people started to tell me that I should go into cataloging, that I'd be good at it. and you know. I had my stereotypes about catalogers, um, you know, the most prudish of the prude and change over my dead body and all that stuff. So I resented people telling me that I was going to be good at this thing. Um, and remember, I was thinking public library reference. It wasn't until I started to see job descriptions for cataloging jobs that I realized, oh, yeah, this is me. This is what I'll be good at because I'd already developed some familiarity with the work. 
I'd gotten engaged with it. I'd started to see where cataloging fits into the broader context of what a library does. And it took realizing that I had the qualifications, I cared enough about what cataloging accomplishes to be able to help me see through those stereotypes that I had and realize that it's okay to want to catalog. Okay, so um, some of the things that I feel now were important for me to know then. Um, what are the qualifications? What did I need to know going into this? And in a way, um, for me, uh, kind of nothing. I, I knew I was interested. I had the aptitude and some skills that were a match um, because of the, the uh, student jobs and internships and things that I'd done. I was really counting on finding a good fit and making a good connection and demonstrating that I was aware of some of the issues in cataloging and technical services and aware of technical services place in the library. So coming in with that big picture view and just being sensitive to the issues, it was the context that I picked up in my internships and jobs that really clinched it for me more so than any super basic skills that I developed, um, you know, like the actual cataloging work. But at the same time, I also needed to know everything. I was going to have to learn it all, um, but that I, you know, going into this, uh, looking at entry-level jobs, felt that that was going to be something that came along after I landed a, a job, though I did have remedial skill in these things going in. Um, so, you know, having to learn MARC, learning how bibliographic data is structured, stored, and retrieved in libraries, that's something, all these things on this bullet are things that I started to pick up right out of the gate, day one at MSU. Um, AACR2, learning the rules for how to transcribe or record information from the things that I'm cataloging. CONSER, okay, so CONSER is a national level serials cataloging group that helps guide serials cataloging practice and policy. Uh, but they also maintain documentation for cataloging serials, rules that go a little bit more in depth on how to catalog serials than AACR2 does. This was a lot to learn because serials are really complicated. They're materials that are issued in parts, you know, they usually have numbering. Um, but they have no predetermined conclusions, so they're bound to change over time. And the catalog record that we're creating for them has to accommodate all of that change. So it's very different from monograph cataloging, and that was a lot of uh, information to require to be ready to do that. And then LCSH, you know, the Library of Congress su subject headings, and LCC, the Library of Congress classification, those were important for me to learn too, so I you know, could assign the subject and call numbers. Um, Things like Dublin Core, MARC, XML, MODS, other metadata things. Um, this wasn't necessarily stuff that I was trying to pick up right out of the gate, but stuff that I was trying to maintain familiarity with, knowing where libraries are going and other things that are happening in other departments outside of cataloging directly. Um, and now, uh, with AACR2 on the way out, or already out, uh, being replaced by RDA, RDA is happening now, I've had to learn that, and since I was on the RDA Implementation Task Force at MSU, I've had to learn it enough to teach it to others, which just happens to be a great way to learn something. Um, and BibFrame is on the way to a new structure for bibliographic da data that will replace MARC. What I'm still learning? Well, we're learning all the time in technical services, and that's a key aptitude to have in this part of the library, a willingness to continue learning learning deeper the things you already know and learning new things entirely is paradigm shift. Um, so what I'm still learning, all of it, um, a goal for me every day is to try and learn a little bit more and hone that expertise however I can. That's one of the things that makes a tech services library invaluable, that deep expertise developed over a long period of time. Also, um, local systems. So. You know, talking about MARC, RDA, and all of these things doesn't even touch on the local integrated library systems that we're all dealing with and other local to tools that use data from the catalogs. So those systems are maybe even more liable to change than cataloging rules or data structures. We've moved from one system to another while I've been here, and there's a learning curve involved with that. Um, and even if you stay with one system, they all have their own idiosyncrasies that have to be worked out or worked around. Local policies, as they have to evolve, you know, the nature of technical services work will always change. The shift from print to digital has been huge. Naturally, local policies about how to do our work have to change and be relearned, too. We have to periodically ask if it still makes sense to do things the way we've been doing them. And local personalities. Of course, because libraries are inhabited by people, you have to learn, relearn, and adapt to the people you work with, the people you work for. 
that's true for any part of the library, not just technical services. And you know, there's this idea that tech services is kind of this haven for librarians with poor social skills. And that's simply not true. A tech services is just as interactive and occasionally political as any public service point might be. So you've got to be comfortable with people or get comfortable with them. And that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. All right, let's see here. Hi, everybody. I, uh, um, I'm really glad to be here today to talk to you about my career in tech services and to encourage you to find out if this is the place for you. There are so many different opportunities in this field, and one of them may be exactly the place you belong. I'm the technical services manager for a multi-branch public library. Um, we have a staff of about 15, and I have under me supervisors for both acquisitions and processing. I started out working for the Tulsa City County Library as a floater, moving from branch to branch, filling in wherever I was needed. This was so not the job for me. I really disliked going into every customer encounter not knowing what was going to come up and whether I was going to be able to help. I remember a reference librarian once saying with glee, you just never know what people are going to ask, and then pointing out to them that that is exactly what made me want to cry. <laughs> when a job opened up in cataloging, I leapt for it, and I found my true home. I loved the order of copy cataloging and the cataloging rules and policies. Uh, that really was the most relaxing work I have ever done, even when it got really hard. I cataloged happily for a couple of years before I realized that as much as I loved it, I did want more variety in my workday. This led to me taking the job of supervising interlibrary loan, then managing the cataloging team, and finally to my current position as tech services manager. Middle management is definitely the place for people who want variety in their day, as well as a bit more control over how those days are spent. There are always so many things going on that if I get bored with one project, I just set it aside and work on something else for a while. And managing people is always an interesting job, if you like that kind of thing. I'm lucky to work with an amazing group who make that part really easy. About 40% of my time is spent managing the work of the department, making sure the work is moving on through and dealing with any problems or issues that come up. I also work with the rest of the people in the department to consider processes and policies and to always look for ways to make things work better. Next week, we meet to discuss our annual plan for the upcoming fiscal year. Each team in the department will present their goals, and then we'll discuss other departmental goals. We're also currently working on a plan that will give us information about the cost of our work, turnaround times, things like that. So we can not only find problem areas, but also compare our costs to those of our outsourcers. And we're coming out way ahead so far. I also provide training with the help of the other supervisors in the department and our training staff on our processes as well as other topics, leadership, uh, team building, conflict management, that kind of thing. I spend a great deal of time communicating with collection development and public service staff to make sure we're focused on the right priorities and are meeting their needs. I meet monthly with the Tech Services Advisory Council to talk about upcoming changes or possibilities to make sure we're considering the needs of public services and our customers. Recently, I sat down with the librarians in our research center to work out a plan to manage their serials as they move into a temporary location while the central library is being remodeled. I meet with branch managers annually just to check in and make sure things are going well. We've created a tech services helpline that everyone takes turns answering, phone and email, to handle any questions or problems that might come up, and to handle the more routine everyday stuff like changing barcodes or reinstating item records. We try really hard to make it easy for them to let us know what they need and then to make that happen. We manage or help out with all kinds of different projects, recently including repackaging DVDs into different locking cases, weeding throughout the system, and changing location codes as the central library prepares for its big move. And of course, there's just the regular day-to-day -day stuff, batch loads and reports. I still catalog some serials and electronic resources, and of course, all those emails. I feel very fortunate that I'm also the backup system administrator for our integrated library system software. 
Since most modules are related to the work of our department, it makes a lot of sense for me to be heavily involved. This has meant learning a lot more about the back end part of our services, how the whole system works together, which has paid huge dividends when making decisions about how to change the system and how to best use it, and has meant learning more than I ever thought I would know about servers and networks. More and more, my work has also been moving toward project management or serving as part of a project team. The library paid for a whole group of us to take several eight-week classes on project management skills and seems very committed to using those skills to help make things happen. I'm currently working on projects to implement our discovery platform, to beta test our new collection management software, planning activities and personnel for projects during the time the central library is closed, working on the implementation of and training for the new RDA cataloging rules, and gathering and reporting statistics for an ongoing demographic study. There are times when by far most of my time during the week is spent on projects not always or even often related to the work of my department. And you can't have libraries without committees. At my library, I have the Tech Services Advisory Council, and I'm also part of a training committee, making plans to update our in-house training practices. Statewide, this year I'm on the Oklahoma Library Association Conference Program Committee and chair of the Continuing Education Committee, as well as taking part in the activities of the Technical Services Roundtable, including co-presenting a program on RDA at our conference last week. Nationally, I have to limit my activities to those things I can do electronically, since I can't count on making the annual conferences every year. But I'm currently serving on the ALA Transforming Collections Task Force and on the advocacy group for ALEX, the National Tech Services Association. So far, I've helped with the work of both of those committees, including planning and co-facilitating a couple of ALA e-forums. And I'm working on another one, on how public libraries should spend their money as they try to balance print and electronic materials. I also spent a couple of years serving as a reviewer for the ALA Tech Services Research Journal. I remember being really intimidated by finding ways to get involved at this level, but putting myself out there to participate has given me lots of new skills and introduced me to some absolutely amazing people. So what do you need to find your home in Tech Services? You need a knowledge of the work and of what interests you. There are so many different areas cataloging and metadata, acquisitions, management, technology and systems, something for everyone. Find out what sounds the most interesting to you and then start looking around. That said, almost everyone I know in tech services has found that things are changing rapidly enough that you may just have to jump in somewhere and see where the currents take you. You just have to commit yourself to learning the skills and becoming an expert at what you do and then be ready to do that all over again when your job changes. You'll need to be willing to take the initiative to make the job your own, especially in tech services, to try things they didn't even know they wanted you to do, along with an openness to learning about and using technology, from spine label printers on up to servers and networks. Being able to take advantage of new technology can mean the difference between succeeding and excelling at your job. Project and teamwork skills will only become more important. No one does just one thing anymore. And being able to manage or participate in projects in a valuable way will definitely keep you in demand and help you prepare to move up the ladder, if that's what you want to do. It also allows you to um, remember the needs of tech services as you're working on some of those projects, which also absolutely never hurts. Communication skills are absolutely key within and outside the department, along with the commitment to contributing to the success of the library. This is a support job, and the only way to do it well is to make sure that you build strong relationships and show a real commitment to finding solutions that work out on the front lines. Having a mentor, someone to talk about talk to about your career never hurts, especially if you can find someone who will really help you identify your strengths and opportunities. You'll notice that most of these qualities are things that will come in handy for any job. The reality is, 
we can teach you the tasks of technical services, from cataloging through acquisitions, even through the server and network stuff, as long as you have the qualities that help you do great at any job that comes along. I have had so many chances to do fun, interesting, and useful things for my library. I really second Josh's comment that you can direct your career in interesting ways and find a way to make your job even more interesting for you personally. Tech services often gives you opportunities to try some really cool things that really make a difference in how well the library works. If you think this might be your place, I would encourage you to find a way to get in there and try it out. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any other questions or would like to discuss this topic further. And thank you very much for coming to our webinar today. And now I'll hand it over to Roberta. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me get this full screen here. Um, I'm going to take sort of the high, the 50,000 foot level approach because I think preservation, depending upon the institution you're in, can, can vary a little bit, both as to the um, activities, um, the degree you're involved, and also in your support and, and the staffing that you're going to have. So um, let's just talk a little bit about what the influence is the, the type of institution and the size of institution might have on on the preservation program. If you're in a public library and let's say you have a small historical collection that's associated with it, you may have or you may be a part-time preservation librarian that is responsible for a wide range of activities. If you're moving into academic library, you could be part-time or full-time, and you may or may not have some staff. Usually, um, your support, you're relying a little bit more on uh, students, and maybe you'll ha you're lucky enough to have one or two support staff that are full-time. And then when you move into a research library, you're more than likely to have a full-time preservation librarian. But the fact of the matter is there are a number of ARL libraries that do not have full-time preservation librarians. So we're sort of talking at the, the far end of that range of possibilities. And you may have then um, full-time professional level staff, a conservator on staff, and then other libra librarian level positions. And continue to rely on students to get work done, as well as um, having uh, support staff. So while the staffing levels could vary dramatically, the activities are going to be pretty much the same, but as I said earlier, it's going to be a matter of degree. Preservation really is a service that goes across library operations. So you're going to be interacting regularly with collection development, acquisitions, cataloging, access, and unlike other parts of the library, you're probably going to get to know your facilities, security, and custodial staffs fairly well. Um, so that's a little bit of a different twist uh, as to what uh, might actually uh, your realm of activities might be. Um, for the most part, the cost, most cost-effective preservation is making sure that you have a good environment. So. We can talk about controlling those multi-legged pests as opposed to the occasional two-legged variety. And keeping your building dry, sometimes that's a bigger challenge than you think it should be, as well as temperatures and relative humidity on an even keel. And in order to do this and interact with your facilities uh, people effectively, you need to have a basic understanding of all the systems that control these factors. Now you're thinking, but what about digital? Well, environment also applies to digital if we think of environment in a, in a sort of a broader scheme. Um, you need to have a good digital infrastructure and an understanding of those systems because if we think about it, our digital repositories are the stacks for our e-collections. So if you're concerned about the stack conditions for your analog material, you certainly are needing to be concerned about what your stacks are for your digital materials. You'll need to have a broad understanding of analog materials, both paper-based and magnetic, especially if you're going into the academic and research collections where these are going to make up a huge amount of your legacy collections. So a grasp of the preservation, those preservation issues as well as the preservation issues surrounding digital formats is going to be necessary. But going back to the analog, 
books are still a major part of most of our collections, and an understanding of book mechanics is really is key. A course in book history and book structures is important in, in gaining that understanding so that you can have intelligent conversations with conservators and binders, your commercial binding. You need to be able to understand what, what you're getting and why you're asking for a certain, certain something or why they're offering a certain something. You need to understand why buying a publisher's hardback may not give you the most durable book that you can purchase. Um, and I think that's really important as our budgets get tighter and tighter. We really need to be sure we're getting, we're getting the quality that we're paying for. Working with acquisitions when contracting with Shelf Ready, if, you're, if libraries are doing more and more of that, it's really important to understand the different types of bindings that are available. What does it really mean when I'm getting an economy binding? And how does that pay off or not pay off in the long run? especially if you're looking at this for long-term preservation. Now, public libraries, they're, they're going to have other issues that they need to balance. But for academic and research, this is something that's really important. And the other thing is, whatever you're deciding or whatever you're telling people, you need to be able to explain your recommendations regardless of the choice. You may decide that economy is the best, but you need to be able to explain why that is. As I mentioned, digitization um, is certainly becoming a huge part of any library these days, public or academic. And understanding what the preservation commitment is needed um, for both converting analog to digital and also acquiring born digital is really important. When we're talking about conversion, so if you're converting an analog to the digital, why are you doing that? Um, a lot of times people haven't really stopped to think about it. They think it's so fast and easy. And so asking why can give someone pause. And I have been in the case, in the, had the case where I've said, well, why are we doing this? And they have, well, access. And I'm saying, oh, so this isn't for long-term preservation. And they look at me and go, of course it's for long-term preservation. So then it's like, okay, it's for access and preservation. That has, those have different concerns that you need to be aware of and you need to be able to explain what that difference is and why they're important. Um, and then the key thing is who and how is preserving the digital? Um, is it going to be in, is it the, the preservation department? Most likely not. The preservation department may be involved, but it's more likely going to be the IT area. Um, and when it comes to the born digital, you need to consider where those files are coming from. Born digital can be things that the staff and faculty are generating but want to be kept. It can also be e-books, e-serials, and data sets. And when we think about e-books and e-serials, those are not necessarily an outright purchase. They are usually a license. So what does that mean in terms of preservation? What does your license say about who owns it and how is it going to be preserved? And is this something that the library cares about? A public library who's buying e-books for the bestseller is probably not concerned about long-term preservation of those electronic files. But a research library may be. And again, for the born digital, is preservation responsible for the digital preservation? So you can see preservation crosses a lot of different covers wide spectrums, covers a lot of different activities, and I can pretty much guarantee it's never dull. Besides the breadth of knowledge across library and facility activities, a good preservation library needs to be a good people person. Um, everyone has, has said that. It's really important. I don't know of any, frankly, in any area of librarianship where you are not involved with people and being able to work with a wide variety of personalities and um, interest levels as to what it is you are doing. Um, in addition, an understanding of budgets is really useful, especially if you're going to be um, leading a preservation department. You probably are going to have a budget that's going to need to be managed. And with tight money coming across the board, I think that this is something that everyone needs to be very um, comfortable with. Um, another thing that I found really interesting really useful is understanding project management and knowing what that is and how to um, carry, 
carry those sort of project management practices forward. Because frankly, most of what we end up doing in preservation are projects. It, they are ongoing processes or workflows, but frequently they're individual projects within that. And so, and you're dealing with different collections across the board. Um, and of course, every curator thinks that their project is the one project. And so being able to juggle a number of projects within a, a process is really important. Talk a little bit about my background. I was actually um, trained as in book conservation. Uh, I was in the first graduating class of conservators at Columbia University's library school. And I worked as a conservator uh, for a good number of years before coming into uh, preservation administration. Um, one of my positions was as chief conservator at Columbia University uh, Libraries. And I started moving into preservation management when I went to New York Public Library first as their head uh, of their physical care units, as it was called at that time. And that covered both their conservation activities and then their commercial binding operations. And from New York Public, um, I came to Yale as director of preservation. But as you could imagine, my training pretty much emphasized binding and treatment of paper-based materials. But the one thing that I thought was really wise about the Columbia program is it also trained preservation administrators. And so the conservators were taking the same classes as the preservation administrators. So conservators, well, all we wanted to do was be at the bench. We were also um, exposed to the full range of preservation issues from understanding HVAC systems to the most basic of how do you write an effective memo, which I guess in the um, and our now our age of email is maybe not as useful a skill, though I will say how learning to be concise and get to the point is probably one of the best things that you could learn. The one thing we did not do is take a management course, which I think um, really should have been mandatory for conservators as well as the preservation administrators, because most conservators uh, find themselves in management. But today we don't have the Columbia program. Um, and for preservation administration, there's, a, there's some other ways of certainly getting into the field and getting, getting the knowledge that you need. Today, most library schools offer basic preservation course, and some offer specialty in preservation consisting of a number of core courses that sort of make up their, their specialty. The University of Texas at Austin, the library school offers a preservation administration certificate and there's, you know, three or four courses that you take that uh, are the basis of that certificate. And then Simmons, Michigan and UNC Chapel Hill offer certificates in digital curatorship or stewardship, which also starts to, to bring in the preservation issues. Um, but for the full-blown, to get, to get a broad picture of both the analog and the digital, I would also um, suggest getting, not getting beyond just the theory, get as much of that as you can, but to take some of those a basic binding course. And if you are still in library school and you happen to be at an institution where there is a preservation department, I would certainly encourage you, if you have any interest in preservation, to see if they would hire you as a student worker while you're in school. Um, being able to get exposed to the practical side of things. I think theory is wonderful as a good base, but then being able to kind of try it out either as a student worker or even an, in an internship is certainly going to be, make it a whole lot more real. and, and be able to see if this is something that you are really interested in. So that's all I have to say, and I'm happy to sort of, um, you know, dr drill down to some more d details instead of at the high 50,000 foot level. So I'm going to turn it back over to our organizers. Erin? Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua, Sarah, and Roberta, for your wonderful presentations today. And we do have a few questions. Our first question is for all of our presenters. And Joshua, if you would go first, please. The question is, please tell us what skills or experiences played the biggest role in you being hired for your current position. 
Well, like I said uh, when I was presenting, um, coming into uh, well, the the inter I didn't talk about the interview per se, but coming into the job uh, with the ability to to contextualize some of the issues um, ended up being a pretty big um, clincher, I'd say. Just being able to um, articulate the light or the uh, articulate technical services and cataloging in particular in the context of library services ended up um, demonstrating that this was something that I was interested in and cared enough about to to think about in those kinds of larger terms. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing for me. I can't say that that would be the biggest thing for everybody, but just um, that kind of care about what cataloging accomplishes um, that leads one to go look for the big picture, I think, is key. And this is Sarah, and I certainly agree with that. I also think that for me, um, I think the biggest thing that got me um, both to be able to be the cataloging manager as well as the tech services manager is the fact that I looked for some opportunities to do things that that either nobody else had thought of or had been willing to do. Um, when I was in interlibrary loan, we still were completely paper-based, and I automated the interlibrary loan office. And in cataloging, too, looked for a lot of process changes. And um, I think taking the initiative to, to take a look, I agree very much that you need to take a look at the big picture and then really find ways to contribute that people just really didn't even think of and that you thought of and made happen on your own? So, well, when I interviewed for the position at Yale, it had been empty for a while, and I was pretty much convinced that they wanted someone with a digital background, which I obviously did not have. Um, but it turns out I, what they were really interested in was the breadth of my experience, which included digital, but was, that was not my strength. Um, but I had had some experience in very large New York public uh, research institutions, managing a, a huge number of people within a very um, active preservation department, covering the full breadth of, of, of those activities. And I think that's probably what did it. Um, so if you're, my, my advice would be if you're really interested in managing a large preservation department is, you know, pick an area that you are really interested in, develop that, and then, and then spread out, you know, expand your, your horizons as it were. Thank you. Our next question is, um, do any of you have advice for getting into technical services, even if you work full time but not in technical services, do you have any tips or suggestions for finding a part time volunteer opportunity? Um, this is Sarah. This is something I've actually thought about quite a bit because I've been asked this question before. It's sometimes really hard to find volunteer opportunities at the library you're at. I know we've in the past had a very hard time making time to train volunteers to do the things that we do. Um, but we um, look for what opportunities are there. I would say set up an appointment with whoever's in charge of tech services. Let them know that you're really interested in it and, and especially what you're interested interested in. Keep up with the projects that they're working on and offer to help if that, if that becomes a possibility. Um, we do staff rotations if that's a possibility. You know, whether they're set up or not, you might ask about that. And then kind of spread out where you're thinking about volunteering. Churches, uh, your church might have a library that needs to be cataloged. The schools are often looking for volunteers and a lot of the school um, media specialists um, don't know a lot about the back end of things and would really like to have some help there. So, um, you know, it's really hard, but you just put yourself out there and make sure people know what you're interested in. Yeah, I would definitely um, second that with what Sarah has said. Um, when it, in some institutions, I know here at Yale, we do try and do a little bit of that cross training or give opportunities. And it can be difficult, but we've also had, you know, people come and they've just asked, they're interested in preservation, can they come talk to me or come talk to one of the other managers and find out, you know, how do I really get into this? And also, as Sarah said, you know, there's the public library, there are other ways of perhaps at least dipping your toe in the water, um, trying some things out uh, to see, 
and it, it hasn't been true so much lately, but on occasion there have been the preservation internships that are offered for mid-career kind of thing. So you might kind of keep an eye out for that when it comes to preservation. Yeah, and this is Joshua. Uh, those are both great responses. I don't know how much more I would have to add. Um, I mean, to take MSU as an example of um, a venue in which people find opportunities to volunteer for that kind of thing, um, there are technical services like activities happening in other departments outside of strictly technical services. So Special Collections, for example, um, does a lot of their own cataloging. Um, and there are people from uh, a public library in our area, for example, that will come to special collections and volunteer. Um, so, you know, like Sarah was saying, looking, casting your net a little wider, looking for volunteer opportunities outside of just your own institution might, might do something for you, too. Okay, the next question is about pursuing a career in technical services without an MLIS. Um, even if someone has several years of library experience, um, what advice do you have to someone that like to pursue uh, opportunity in this field without the appropriate degree? Again, this is Sarah, and I have to say you, you just have to, um, if, you're, if you're not able to get your MLIS, you just um, then have to consider where your opportunities are going to be. Probably not realistic to pursue a career in tech services um, at large libraries, even large public libraries. The opportunities we have here um, um, would be in processing and acquisitions, and if you're interested in those areas, then certainly we don't require an MLIS. Um, but if you want to be a manager or if you want to be a cataloger, um, although that's becoming less true all the time, and MLIS really helps. But when you start looking around um, at smaller libraries, smaller public libraries especially, um, depending on the state, you don't necessarily need an MLIS to do anything all the way up to being a library director um, in some places. So it's really just a matter of um, of knowing which positions um, are going to be available to you and which are not, because some of them just are not going to be available. Well, and I know in, with preservation and some of the very large um, research libraries, you do not need an MLS. You may, well, I shouldn't say may, you will need a master's of some sort, but not necessarily an MLS depending upon what area. Certainly in preservation, an MLS is not absolutely necessary. You can have other um, master's degrees and then have some practical training somewhere along the line or take additional courses and on-the-job on experience that um, would qualify you for any number of the positions within preservation. Um, and then there are positions as support staff which don't require degrees, which may, again, make I'm thinking of our conservation technicians who are some of the most highly skilled technicians I've ever worked with are just, um, you know, some have masters, some don't have a degree. Um, but again, it's their skill level that uh, we're looking at. And so in that case, it's hand skills which are, you know, um, the key and then you build on the, the knowledge to apply those appropriately. Yeah, we, I guess it varies from place to place. We here at MSU actually do have support staff who are catalogers, um, people actually that I defer to uh, with questions from time to time. Um, they've been around for a long time and aren't going anywhere, so you can't get their jobs. But, um, yeah, I mean, what advice would I give to someone in that situation trying to advance their, their career? Um, I guess just the same advice to, to, uh, that we gave on the last question is to keep an open mind about where you can do that work and always be looking for opportunities even in places that you might not expect to find them. Okay, great. We have um, time for one more question. And this is, if you were to give an elevator speech for why technical services matters, what would you say? Oh, I have had to figure out our elevator speech for preservation, but for technical services, I've just said to people, if you can't find it and it's in and once on the shelf, 
and if you can't keep it there, then what's the point of the library? So you've got cataloging and preservation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I hate the elevator speeches, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Be prepared to explain to them what value you do add, and we've been very lucky here to um, we we outsource some things, but we don't don't outsource a lot of the things that allow us to really provide better access to our customers than would be provided if, say, a vendor were 100 percent responsible for it. So just be prepared to know what you do in your department that provides that additional access that makes sure the materials get out there faster than they would otherwise, um, that ensures that you know, you're always thinking of ways um, to better serve the customers in, in ways that people from outside um, the library just wouldn't be thinking of. Um, they're going to be, the, the things that you're going to tell them are going to have to be very local in nature because hopefully locally you're really thinking about how you add value to your library. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, it's really a matter of challenging this dominant perspective that technical services um, is an old thing, that we do things old ways, and that it doesn't matter as much anymore as it used to. But in fact, technical services at any library is the infrastructure for how things are accessed and discovered. Um, so I mean, it's really a matter of being able to explain that to someone um, in whatever local context that requires, saying like, no, this is, is in fact the infrastructure by which everything else happens. And that said, as much as I hate them, you should have that elevator speech ready. <laughs> okay. We are now at the end of our time. Any unanswered questions that were submitted will be sent to Joshua, Sarah, and Roberta, and all attendees will receive the answers via email. If anyone has any follow-up questions, you can always contact each of our presenters by email. As a reminder, you will be receiving a copy of the recording and slides in your email within a few days. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful preservation, uh, presentations today. I would like to thank all of our attendees, and I hope that you found today's session useful. You will so soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few moments to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee as we plan new continuing education offerings. Information about ELECT's offerings can be found on our homepage under Online Learning. We do have a few opportunities coming up. Next week we have three webinars, um, since it is Preservation Week, the Preservation of Family photo Photographs, Personal Digital Archiving, and Archival 101, dealing with suppliers of archival products. If you're interested in signing up for any of our web courses, please see our 2013 schedule on our um, ELECT's events page. And next week, we will also be hosting an e-forum, e-book mark records in the age of AECR2, provider neutral guidelines, and how now RDA. I'd like to thank the ELECT's new members interest group officers, Liz Seiler, Emily Sanford, Aaron Boyd, Alyssa Sander, and Deanna Groves for sponsoring and planning today's webinar. Thank you to Carrie Cassio, chair of the ELECT's continuing education committee, for her support and assistance in preparing this webinar. I'd also like to thank Felicity Dykus and I Ping Shen Gaffey for providing technical support, as well as Julie Reese and Vicki Grzynski and the ELECT's office. The support our technical support provides makes it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope that you will participate in another ELECT's continuing education offering again in the future.